I was born to a mother and father who were both in the U.S. Marine Corps. So I just kind of give you some background of the kind of, uh, you know, philosophies and structure that I grew up in. Um, big military family, lots of cops and judges and so on. Um, I, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, when I was uh, 18, I went into the U.S. Marine Corps. and I wanted to be like my dad and my mom. So uh, um, spent uh, about five years active duty there, uh, participated in some specialized units. And um, but the problem was, is uh, when I was a kid, I wanted I had three things I wanted to do. And, and, and this is kind of speaks to, you know, folks that are getting started on their career. You know, I used to always daydream about being a Marine and then I was daydreaming about being a cop and then I was daydreaming about being in the movies. I wanted to be a ninja. You know, that was kind of hard. I haven't figured out that one yet. But I was able to do the other three to some degree. And uh, I had no real plan, but I just visualized it a lot. And I'll get into some of that later of how that helped. But um, so I started out, I went in the Marine Corps, I did my time there. Um, wanted to be a police officer, so I got out and went back to Atlanta and um, got started there as uh, in the police academy and um, went through uh, that and got out, went to my first precinct as a patrol officer, um, did a few years on the street, um, took the detective's test, made detective, <clears throat> went into the robbery homicide unit, got promoted to sergeant, went back to the street. Everybody's always got to go back to the street when you get ranked. You got to go back and make sure you can, you can lead the line officers on the street. Um, and then I made detective sergeant, went back into the detective bureau. Around 2004, um, had the opportunity to go overseas as a, as a contractor and work for the State Department doing close protection for diplomats in, in Iraq. And so I did that for a while. And then the organization I was working for sent me over to Jordan next door. And I was uh, what they called the country manager for their organization. And then um, had an opportunity to go work for some folks, including King Abdullah uh, for a new special operations training center that um, they had just built. So I was one of the team there. And then after a few more years, I'd been in Jordan for a long time. I was kind of the go-to American guy for new projects. And so um, uh, I was asked to join the State Department, uh, the U.S. Embassy there to help with a, a training program that they were running for our foreign partners uh, called Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program. And I did that for a number of years. And finally, uh, I went back to the U.S. and um, got into the corporate world. Um, in between there, I was doing uh, movies. I was a technical advisor on several war films and training the actors and stuff like that to act like soldiers and Marines. And so now I'm in the corporate sector uh, working for a wealth management firm as their uh, vice president over physical security, business continuity, and uh, real estate. And that's, that's the story. Just coming back to the work as a, as a, as a detective, I mean, there's a, so there's a, there's a phase there where you're in the Marine Corps and then you, you go from that to being a police detective. How did that, how did that come about? Yeah, so completely unrelated. Um, I, I know in a lot of countries, you know, they'll have like a, a gendarmerie, which is, you know, kind of a paramilitary organization where it acts like a, a, a police department and acts kind of like military in some respects. But uh, here, the, the military and the police are two separate bodies. Um, I uh, discharged from the Marine Corps and I, I had to apply for a job, you know, with the police department that I wanted to go with. And that was in metropolitan Atlanta. I applied for the police academy. It took me about a year to go through the entire process. That's uh, initial interviews, um, psychological examinations, um, physical examinations. Um, uh, there's other stages there in between, a full background investigation and so on. And then eventually, if you pass all that, you'll get a letter that says, uh, okay, you've been selected to join this police academy. You know, you'll report on this day and time. I graduated the academy. Um, we had a number of precincts that we could select to try to go to. I selected the one that was that that was the busiest. That's where I wanted to go learn, uh, which is in Southeast Atlanta. Uh, reported in there as a rookie officer. You're, you're paired with a field training officer, a seasoned police officer, and you ride around with them for <clears throat> um, a number of weeks until they set you free on your own, and then. Um, then you're out there by yourself. After about three years, you're eligible to apply or take the detective's test. 
the detectives test. Um, you're also eligible to do other things like try to join the SWAT team and other specialized units. Um, and I, I noticed from reading your biography, you worked at a number of departments. Seems like uh, you managed to cover quite a few. Um, was there a, a particular department you, you favored or what were some of the more rewarding aspects to, to, that, to that job? Yes, that's absolutely. Um, I, um, when I went from patrol, when I took the detectives test, and typically with a green detective, like a new detective, you would, um, you would be put into a, like a, maybe a precinct dete detective unit, like a burglary or, or theft, general theft or something like that, to kind of get your feet wet. And um, I was really fortunate to go straight into the robbery homicide unit. Which, which we looked at as like uh, you know elite level detectives who are seasoned and you know working lots of murders and and, uh, and serious violent crimes, and um, so yeah, that was a big step for me going from detect or going from patrol into that unit, and um, um, I I grew up a lot in that unit very quickly just because uh, we we do cut we do handle a lot of murders. Uh, I think I was. I was there for four years in that unit, and um, we easily, uh, as a team, worked um, a few hundred murders and more. You quickly uh, learn the profound nature of the duty that you're doing, especially when it's um, involving uh, death notifications. So you're, you, know, you spend a lot of time going to strangers' homes and letting them know in the middle of the night that they've lost probably the most important person in their life. Um, the whole process as emotional as it is for those families taking them from this horrible thing just happened to you to um, hopefully guiding them to a point to where they have some level of closure and capturing the person that did it um, and then of course there's a the whole process of going uh, preparing your court uh, documents and so on and helping the district attorney uh, prosecute a good case and being a good witness um, in the trial and so on and so uh, that, that was probably the most profound duty of the period of time I spent in the police department. I left there later and went, I was in the SWAT, uh, I was in SWAT, which is a special weapons and tactics team. Mm -hmm. And um, those were all great experiences. And then I was a commander over the vice unit, which is like prostitution and gambling and <clears throat> where you're managing uh, undercover detectives and so on. But uh, going back to uh, robbery homicide was, was definitely life-changing. How important do you think having a degree is to be able to get into your field of work? Um, I think a, a degree is advantageous. Um, I don't think it's the only way. Um, I will say that in some respects, you can be held back if you don't have a degree. For example, if, say if you got into law enforcement and you made a career out of it. Um, you may get to a point to where you want to be the chief of police for that department. And there may be a stipulation that says, well, you got to have, uh, you got to have a degree or you got to, maybe you have to have a, you know, a master's degree for that matter. Um, so that may, that may hamper your situation if it's, if it's written in stone. Um, for me, however, um, I don't have a degree and, um, I, you know, I, I went straight into the Marine Corps after high school and, um, you know, I, I made my way by what I would call just stepping into the gap, you know, and, and it's, and it's an exercise that I would take of, uh, to build a program in my mind for taking action. So every chance that I would get, um, I would step into the gap. If, if, for example, when you're in a class and the teacher said, or the professor says, uh, Hey, um, okay, it's time to give us your, your um, you know, uh, you stand in front of class, it's time to give you your, uh, your assignment, who's going to go first. I would, auto, I would always try to go first. And it's not that I was trying to, to suck up to, to the teacher or anything. I was trying to build a habit of getting more confident. And even if I, I used to do it on obstacle courses, like if it was a bunch of people out and like, okay, here's the obstacle course. Who wants to go first? I would be like, I'll, I'll do it. And even though I would fail, maybe I'd do something embarrassing because I'm the first one going. And you know that feeling you get in your gut and you're like, I don't want to be the first one. That's what I was fighting. I was fighting uh, that feeling. And 
by constantly stepping into the gap, even if somebody had a better time than me, often the, the people who are watching, the decision makers, even the peers around you, they're not paying attention necessarily to who ran that obstacle course the fastest. They look at that first person and what they did and go, wow, that guy was that guy's kind of bold. Um, and in their subconscious, they start thinking, that's, that's the kind of things that really make up a good leader. You know, um, that's, you know, someone who doesn't hesitate, someone who makes decisive action. And so I would always, throughout my career, just try to step into that gap as quickly as possible. And then, you know, at my age now, it's second nature. I don't even think about it. I don't get shook up or get the butterflies of having to step up in a meeting and go first. And because I took those actions when I was young and did it throughout my career, I would always be lifted up by other people into positions. Thinking about a career as a, as a, as a police detective, if someone is applying to that, um, that career, what specific advice would you have them to help them sort of break into that? Sure, and, and in, if, in most places, even across the world, you usually can't go straight to detectives. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, you'd have to go and perform um, you know, some kind of patrol duty or something like that. But um, I, I would say if your goal is to become a detective, then there are some other, um, I guess, um, characteristics or traits that you should work on now. And um, one of those would be like attention to detail. Um, being attentive to detail is, is critical uh, as a detective, especially uh, when you're working serious crimes like uh, robberies and homicides. Good writing skills, um, organizational skills, those are all key. Everybody always thinks when they watch TV about, you know, a homicide detective, uh, they're out there and, they're, you know, they're solving a murder in one hour on television. But one thing that they don't account for is, is that detective's got to do a lot of writing. They're doing case notes through the entire course, you know, constantly documenting everything. And at the end, they got to write a pretty comprehensive um, court supplemental to send off to the district attorney's office. And, you know, these are lawyers that are getting it and looking through there, and it's got to make sense to them. And then the other skill that I would put a lot of emphasis on, and this goes to any career, is uh, getting to the point where you feel confident talking in, in front of a group of strangers. For me, that started out with having to go up in front of a court and testify um, and be prepared to get grilled by some defense attorney who is going to totally try to rip my case apart um, and being able to think on your feet and... Um, and, and not just crumble under the pressure. So those are, those are some of the things I think that are, are great in any occupation, but especially if you're gonna try to become a detective. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, is, is there anything you'd like to say in closing? Yeah, my last piece of advice would be um, manage your expectations because, um, you know, when you're, especially when you're, you're getting out of school and you've got this idea that, you know, you're planning things out and, you're, you're hoping everything's going to go on kind of this trajectory of, you know, straight, straight up. Right. And, um, everybody is, is going to have a level of calamity and, um, catastrophe that happens in their lives, whether it's personal tragedies, whether it's, uh, um, things that work out at a job, you get fired, you get laid off, you don't get the promotion you want, whatever the case may be. So really that trajectory ends up looking like that back down, you know, up and then down. So there's really no straight lines. So if you are going out into the world and you're just kind of think to yourself, um, you know, what I can control and what I can't control. And the things that you can't control, you can't control what other people do. You can't control what happens in uh, the world or the atmosphere. Uh, you can only control your reactions to these things. And if you stop worrying about what the future holds and you stop thinking about what happened in the past uh, and you kind of surrender a bit to that, you, you'll have a much more uh, enjoyable time going on this roller coaster up and down that will probably be your career. Um, sometimes when you get, when you're, when you're shooting for the end result of wherever it is that you want to go, sometimes you're going to end up going around the side and coming through the back door to get to it. So uh, that's what I'd leave you with.